Welcome to Musings from Arledge. We have a special guest today. You probably recognize him. I know you're going to recognize his voice because this is the voice of the Trojans for many years now, Pete Arbogast. Pete, welcome. Thanks. Been looking forward to this for the better part of a week now. It's good. All right. Well, you have uh, you look like you're on vacation. I understand that you are on vacation. And uh, so I appreciate you uh, coming to talk USC football despite that. Yeah, coming back soon. It won't be long now because we're we're inside three weeks or so to to get ready for the opening game. So, I actually, have to start paying attention to the world now. Yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate. All right. So, if we're going to pay attention to the world, it's hard not to notice what's going on with the Pac-12, uh, and and I guess whether the Pac-12 is even going to exist uh, a year or two from now. Let's start with a big picture question. We're both USC fans in good standing. At least I think I'm a USC fan in good standing. Um, should we even care what happens with the Pac-12? Uh, only from an historical standpoint. Like when I was a kid sitting around watching Pac-8 basketball on Channel 5 or Channel 11 a thousand years ago on a Sunday afternoon. That kind of thing. The romantic notion of the conference is is nice. We're not going to be in it, uh, but I'll probably always keep an eye on it, I guess. Uh, like I kept an eye on the Big Ten uh, in, in hatred, to be quite honest, uh, because that's the way we, we were raised. Yeah, uh, They were the bad guy. And so you kind of kept an eye on them because you wanted to know who you were going to play in the Rose Bowl, that kind of thing. Um I don't think it. I don't think it does. I don't think it does matter. No. Yeah, I, you know, I've I sort of come to that conclusion too, which is strange because for forty years now, I've been, I've been uh, a a fanatic for USC football, which means that the Pac ten, Pac twelve, meant a whole lot to me. But the longer this has gone on, the more I had concluded that the Pac ten was, uh, or the Pac twelve. I guess it's now the Pac ten again. Was um, if anything, holding USC back and maybe, maybe was interested in holding USC back. And I don't know if that's fair, but that's sort of the way I felt about it. And, um, and so I, and I think other USC fans kind of became a little bitter about the conference over the last five, 10 years. Well, what, what do you think? I mean, do, do we have a right to be unhappy with the PAC 12 and maybe even take some, uh, maybe and get a little bit of glee out of what's going on? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that decisions about contracts, television contracts, media contracts, and, and scheduling, and all that is made at a way higher level than me, which means everybody. And I, I don't pretend to understand all that, all that goes into that. Uh, all that being said, um, I had heard rumor, and I'm sure you had too, and maybe just talk, just idle chatter at at fan fests, Trojan club meetings. Uh, it's just walking around the stadium, sitting with you guys uh, before a game uh, at, at any stadium that, gee, we should leave the conference and become Texas or Notre Dame and, and, and become an independent and have our own TV network. And hey, we're bigger than this. Why are we sharing revenue with Washington State and Oregon State? What, what, what's the value of that to us other than being part of the collective? Well, being part of the collective is probably a good thing. Uh, Notre Dame's going to probably have to do that eventually, uh, pretty soon probably. Um, but we're part of another collective now, which is fine. Uh, and, and it seems to be making monetary sense from all I'm reading for USC and for UCLA to, to do what they have done and, and leave the Pac-9 behind. You know, it's interesting that you're right. You look at it and you say USC – is contributing probably about $100 million a year to the rest of the conference. At least that's a conclusion that the University of California report came up with, right? That, that the, the remaining members of the conference are losing about $100 million a year with USC leaving. Um, and that's a, lot of, that's a lot of charity, right? But here's the funny thing. USC is now going to go to another conference that that essentially has the same thing in place, right? Indiana and Purdue and Northwestern, they make the same amount of money as Ohio State and Michigan for no reason other than historical accident, right? They've just been around a long time. 
Um, so USC would be making substantially more money, but you still have the same sort of setup where you have the, the Ohio States, Michigans, and USC's that are making uh, dramatic contributions and a lot of programs that make very little monetary contribution. And I wonder, maybe, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but I wonder how long that can survive in an era where loyalty and tradition are sort of out the window and people are simply making monetary decisions. If we look at it from a competitively parity standpoint, uh, it, it needs to stay status quo because that money needs to trickle down so that those other schools can remain com somewhat competitive, at least within the confines of their conference. Uh, to do otherwise would be to say, let's shave off the top three or four schools from each of these major conferences and go form the super conference yeah. uh, with, with, with SC, UCLA, Oregon, Washington, and then we go Michigan, and, and Notre Dame and Ohio State and somebody, Wisconsin. And then we do the same to the SEC. We do the same to the ACC, the same to the Big 12. And those 20 teams, they're the show. And yeah. now they don't have to share money with nobody. And, yeah. and the competitive parity is still there within that 20-team 20, 20 grouping. So, hey, look, the final words haven't been written. You know that. I know yeah. that. It's, it, every day I check the wire just to see what's next. I know. it's uh, It's a crazy time. So – so, all right, let's, uh, neither one of us are, are qualified to do this, but let's pretend for a second that we're the president or the athletic director at Oregon or Washington right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So those schools, those schools, it appears were not wanted by the Big Ten the first time around, but these are schools that actually add something. People watch these programs, they care about them. They would, even in the Big Ten, both of those programs would be above average contributors, right? So they're looking at this, and I suspect they're thinking, okay, I want to get a Big Ten invite, but I haven't gotten it yet. How long do I sit around and wait to see whether my conference falls apart? Because at some point, if they lose the four corner schools, Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, Colorado, they disappear. You now have a pack, what, a pack six? What are they going to do? They're going to add Boise and UNLV and San Diego State. And, and you're going to look around at some point and say, I waited too long to make this jump. If you're those guys, are you calling the Big 12 now and saying, I think I'm ready, guys? Or are you going to stick around and see what happens? Uh, I think they're Big 10 bound. I really do. Uh, you're right, though. They're going to bring in San Diego State and Hawaii and UNLV and the you know, SMU is probably bound for the Big 12, too. We're, we're not anywhere near through this. And I think Oregon and Washington, I think you're right. I think they're the two that would probably fit okay in a Western division of a revamped Big 10 or Big 20, whatever it turns out to be. Uh, I, I, you know, Uncle Phil's got the cash. If, if, they need to, if he needs to pay some money, he's, he's going to buy his way in. I don't know how Washington does it necessarily, but uh, they want to have their partner to go with them, I think, and that would make sense, too. I, I, ultimately, I think that happens, and I think it happens relatively quickly. So here's – here's uh, now let's let's pretend we're sitting in uh, Heritage Hall making decisions at USC. I, I don't know who's making decisions at USC right now. I guess we'll, mm. we'll find out at some point soon when a new athletic director is hired. But um, we're sitting there, and, and we're having a, a conversation over lunch, and I tell you, Pete, I get it. Oregon and Washington uh, are football programs with some cachet. They have, uh, they have, you know, a, a good fan base. They're going to help television ratings. We probably make more money with them in the conference than a lot of other possible uh, additions. Here's my problem, Pete. I don't want those guys, especially Oregon in the Big Ten, because those guys are competitors for us in, in West Coast recruiting, particularly in Southern California aren't we better off having them in a lesser conference and shouldn't we put our foot down and tell Ohio state and Michigan and all the rest? No, we simply won't yeah. tolerate it. Yes, you are correct. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Um, and, and but it, the other half of that coin is though, that if the PAC 10, 12, nine remains a viable thing, which we have to think it's going to, and they bring in a bunch of other teams, well, Oregon and Washington are the show. Uh, in almost every sport. And so, 
And so uh, the winner of the conference all of a sudden is, is getting a seat at the table in the playoffs every year. Maybe they're more interested in that than, than joining a conference where it's ultra and super competitive for them. And, and now they're the only team on the West Coast that says we can make it to the, to the big dance, as it were, in, in college football. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Although I, I, I suppose if you're those schools – you're a little bit worried that you're going to lose Utah, Arizona, Arizona State. You're going to have to bring in replacements that are a cut below. Because at some point, I think the SEC and the Big Ten look at it and say, okay, we're not going to treat you like an equal at this point. When you had USC and UCLA, when you had, when you had the, you know, the, 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 the corner schools, as they're being called, fine. But right now, it's... It's Oregon and Washington, which are good programs, but not, not Georgia, not Alabama, not Ohio State. They're not that level. And everybody else in the conference is completely irrelevant. Why in the world are we going to treat you like an equal to us? I mean, isn't that going to happen at some point? Well, and, and you're right. They, and SC and UCLA could say, no, hey, you just let us in. And maybe behind doors, uh, who knows, when this was all coming down when it did. Uh, maybe uh, that was part of the deal in the first place is that we're coming by ourselves and we know we don't want anybody else from this conference joining us. I mean, we don't know what kind of deals were made yeah. to assure that SC and UCLA were going to, maybe they wanted it that way. Yeah. I wondered, I mean, I, I have no idea. Nobody tells me anything, but, uh, and for good reason, but at the join same the time, join the club, join <laughs> yeah. the club. At the same time, I, I wondered if, if I'm USC, I make that jump. I'm adding a lot to the big 10 and the big 10 is going to appreciate that, but I think I'm going to tell them. I'm tired of having Oregon um, maybe offer money to recruits that I'm trying to land. Maybe? Well, I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying not to defame them. I usually do defame them, but you're here and I'm on my best behavior. Look. Well, and now anybody anybody can add, you can throw money at people now. With NIL, it doesn't make any difference. It's, uh, that's off the table. Yeah, except, except USC doesn't seem to be interested in doing it the same way, right? Uh, this... This idea that we're going to to guarantee money up front to get a signature. USC is not interested in playing that game, and some of our opponents are, which I guess is a is a whole other issue. But um, yeah, I sometimes wonder whether or not USC uh, said we want to join. Great for us. We actually don't want Oregon around. But leave them over there where they can die. I don't know. By the way, you know, I <laughs> off subject a little bit. Uh, I often think about what Sandy Koufax would make in free agency today. Huh. I wonder. I wonder what Reggie Bush might make in NIL money uh, if, if th this was around when he was playing. Holy moly! It's a good. It's a good question, and and part of the way to get that answer might be to figure out what Caleb Williams is making. And I, yeah. it, it's got to be look. Caleb Williams in in. He, in some ways, he doesn't have Reggie Bush's resume in that Reggie Reggie was a two-time national champion coming into his into his last year. But at the same time, you know, Williams is returning Heisman Trophy winner, easily the best player in the country. I don't think anybody really doubts that. A future number one uh, draft choice, and probably, I think, you tell me, I think he's probably going to be the biggest star in college football this year since maybe Tim Tebow was around. Right. I think he's going to have that level of that level of fame and notoriety, I think. Um, yeah, so but I'm going to I'm going to flip the table on you as interviewer and interviewee. And it's a, sure. it's a break in the fourth wall. Not supposed to do that. Whatever it is. Uh, I'm asking you a question. Do yeah. you think that he can or will not win the Heisman Trophy again, assuming he has a similar year to the last year um, because of various outside possibilities of influences? Zero chance Caleb Williams wins the Heisman Trophy this year. Wow. And, 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 and I'm saying that despite the fact that I, every single Heisman voter knows that he's the best player in the country. Right? right. The guy's extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, you can say, you can compare it to Pat Mahomes, which may be a little bit unfair. Mahomes is a two-time Super Bowl winner. But if you look at the skill set, it's similar. But Caleb Williams has done more in college than Mahomes did in college. He's an incredible He's got Carson Palmer's arm talent, and he runs around like uh, he runs yeah. around like uh, like RJ Sauer. I mean, I, it's and he's got and he's got the size of Lindell White. It's crazy the skill set that guy brings. But and so I, I, I'm I'm telling you now, 
everybody knows he's the best player in college football, but nobody wants there to be another two-time Heisman winner, and I cannot for the life of me figure out why everybody wants to keep Arch No, Manning. but you know, nobody in the Midwest is going to nobody in the Midwest is going to vote for him because they all want Archie Griffin to stay the only one. Nobody in the South is going to vote for him because they won't. Um, so, so that's two strikes against you. Uh, for Archie Griffin shouldn't have been anyway, because if they would have held the vote until after the Notre Dame game, we know who would have won. Yeah. His, his initials aren't AG, they're, they're AD. And then OJ should have been the first time winner. Let's be honest. Gary Beaven couldn't hold his job. Yep. Yeah, no, this is all fair. I, look, the reality is that uh, Archie Griffin was a great football player. That's fine. And he seems like he's a pretty good dude. All that's great. He wasn't close to the best Heisman winner. He wasn't, right? I mean, not, right, even, right, in, right. not even in the discussion of the best Heisman winners of all time. So it's a little bit crazy that everybody wants to keep him in that spot where he's the only guy to win it twice. But I'm convinced there are enough people that want that that Caleb has no chance. You know, and remember, those are, the days, those are the days when they didn't vote for non-seniors. That, that was a yeah. miracle that he won. Yeah. A miracle. Yeah, they didn't. The non-senior wasn't even on the list most of the time. Look, you you, you saw, uh, you saw what what Bo Jackson did as a, as a college running. You saw what what Barry Sanders did. Yeah. I've never seen a better a better ball carrier than Barry Sanders, and he probably had the greatest season of any running back in history. I mean, it was unbelievable. You look at that and you say, I mean, Archie. Archie Griffin? I mean, he's not in the same, he's not in the same universe as these guys. But I think it's gonna keep I think it's gonna keep Caleb Williams from having a legitimate shot at it. I always want to say also that if OJ had played four years at USC, they'd still be looking at his records. Yeah, that seems right. I I think it's also probably the case that if he would have played in a different era with a more wide open game, right? Because in you know, in, in OJ's day, he's going to have eight in the box and you're running off tackle. I mean, you know, yeah. these days you spread the field with four wideouts and give OJ that kind of space. And and he would be <laughs> in the secondary almost every – I mean, it would just be unbelievable. Steve Soggy threw six passes against UCLA, I believe, in 1967 in the in the game, the 21-20 game. So yeah, uh, they weren't exactly playing back. They weren't dropping eight. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Uh all right, so I guess I guess we'll see what happens with the Pac-12. I will say this though, I, I I don't feel bad for Oregon because I don't like Oregon. I do feel bad for the Oregon states and the Washington states of the world. Oregon and Washington are going to land somewhere and they'll be fine. But there's a good chance I think that Oregon State and Wazoo and maybe Cal uh, are going to sort of be left out in the cold the way Rice, SMU, TCU, and Houston were when the Southwest Conference blew up, right? And they just so. The question is not those three. The real question is, what about Stanford? I, yeah, look, I, I've got to think that Stanford has enough cachet, both as both as an academic institution and and um, and even their football tradition, which isn't they're not consistent. I think we can agree on that. But Chris, but, if they if they're not going to play NIL and they're not going to play transfer portal in football. They're picked to come in last by some distance this year in the Pac-12. I, I know they're terrible this year. Um, here's a but here's going to get better. About, here's a weird thing about Stanford, though. For the right for the right player, Stanford is extraordinarily difficult to beat and recruit. Right? Because because guys that are good students, especially offensive linemen and quarterbacks, guys that play positions where there's a lot of thinking involved and, and these guys come out of high school and they're, and they're good students. They probably wouldn't get into Stanford if they, if they couldn't play football, but they can, if they do right. Stanford, Stanford has a huge advantage with those sorts of players. Mm -hmm. And in a way that like, there's no sort of player that Arizona has a natural advantage for, right? They don't. It, Maybe a kid that grows up in Arizona, but even a kid that grows up in Arizona really wants to play at USC if he can, or maybe Oregon or someplace like that. So Stanford shouldn't be as bad as they are, right? The, 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 what we're seeing, what we're going to see this year from Stanford, which is going to be awful, really isn't what Stanford should be. But I don't know how committed they are to winning football games at this point. Right, right, right. And, and they're great across the board. They have more national championships across the board than anybody. Uh, so they should be a nice plum to pick for somebody. 
but do they want to stay around if Washington and Oregon go to the Big Ten? Do they want to stay around and be in, be in this mess? Yeah, I, look, I could imagine Stanford saying at some point, we don't want to play this game anymore. The modern college football with the, mm-hmm. with the NIL and the money and all of this other stuff, we don't want to do it. We, we would rather we'd rather join with Vanderbilt and, uh, and whoever <laughs> else, right? I mean, I could see them opting out. That wouldn't be that, – that's not what Washington State and Oregon State are going to do. They're not going to opt out. They may just be stuck. Stanford, I suspect if Stanford went to the Big Ten and said, we want to be a member, we're willing to commit to football success, here's our plan, uh, that the Big Ten might actually be intrigued by that in a way they wouldn't be by some of these other programs. But I don't know. Yeah, they, sure, they could join the Ivy League, like you said in your recent call. I think I like the idea. <laughs> yeah. No, that's Northwestern probably- and Vanderbilt and Duke. Uh, yeah. they, look, look, Oregon, Washington join the, the Big Ten. Arizona, Arizona State go to the Big 12. Utah goes to the Big 12. Stanford and Cal, uh, everybody else just joins, merges with the Mountain West. And that becomes a bigger conference than it is if it's a, if it's a nothing pack, whatever it is, and, and what's left of the Mountain West, maybe they get together and form, form a conference that makes sense. Yeah, that may be right. Although it's a conference that's not going to make any money. Right. I mean, you, you're going to go from 30 million a year, yeah. which is which is right. not great compared to the Big Ten and the SEC to five million, six million a year. I mean, that's going to yeah. that just yeah. dramatically it, changes. It's, it's, it's ultimately FCS. Yeah, ultimately. I think, I think that's right. I mean, yeah. I mean, look, you have you have what, 64 major college football teams. But of those 64, how many of those are real players and how many of them are like. Indiana and and Washington State yeah. just 20 20 ish yeah I mean at some point a premier league a situation probably makes yeah. sense where you have a, yeah. you have a couple of conferences or maybe one conference with a few divisions you're about the size of the NFL and and it looks mm-hmm. a lot like the NFL in terms of free agency and and the money that uh, that's being made I'll go on a limb and say that that's going to happen. The major, that one giant super major conference is going to happen before I check out. And I got about 10, 15 years left. So before that time comes, I think that's going to happen. I think that's probably right. Um, okay. Let's shift gears a second. I, w- I want to talk to you about being a play by play man, because I think it's fascinating and I talk for a living, but I don't get to talk about football for a living other than this. And I don't make any money off it. Um, and so, um, I- I'm curious about a few things. One is I want to talk about you, you were, you were born in the Midwest, but you grew up in LA and I don't know if, I don't know if, uh, if people think about this very often, but if you want to be a play by play man growing up in LA, when you did maybe about the best place in the world to grow up, right? I mean, you've got Vince Scully, you've got Chick Hearn, two very different styles, but two, you know, but two of the absolute best that ever lived, right? I mean, so you, you, who were your big influences when you were uh, when you were growing up, listening uh, listening on the radio to uh, to play by play? Man? And I'll preface that by saying that I lived in Chicago for exactly two weeks, where my dad was on the radio there, and then we moved to New York for about six months, and then we were in LA. So it didn't take long. Yeah, um, he got a job at the old KMPC, the old seven ten, and was there forever. Um, all, all of the, all of them, all of them, uh, primarily, uh, I'm going to start with Tom Kelly. Uh, and, and I say that because my earliest memory of hearing a game on the radio the night before I had gone to the old LA classic, which predates you by some distance, uh, where SC and UCLA used to bring in six of the very best college basketball teams in the country to play at the old sports arena when it was brand new, uh, to play an eight-team, four-game, three-game, three-game uh, holiday classic at the sports arena right after Christmas. So the night before, I, I, the day before, my grandfather, who uh, was a Shriner and was working the children's uh, circus across the street at the Shriners Hospital, took me and a friend. Uh, we were seven, uh, maybe eight. I think we were seven. Dropped us off at the sports arena at 12 noon for the first of the four games of the day. 
said, here's uh, here's five bucks. Uh, I'll be back at eight o'clock tonight to watch the last game with you. You can do whatever you want in here. Don't get in trouble or I'll beat you. And uh, and and when it's when eight o'clock it's on that clock up there, I want you sitting in these two seats where you're supposed to be, and I'll be here. And I'll, we'll watch the game, and then we'll go home. So I I got to see that SC team was the 1961 team, which I believe won the conference that year, which has only happened one other time, two years later, 1963, to actually win the conference in basketball, flat out, no tournament title, no they just won it, and they went to the NCAA tournament. Uh, the next night I sleep over at his house and he said, Hey, uh, sorry, couldn't take you to the games tonight, but would you like to listen to the game on the radio? And I was like, what, what do you mean? And he, and he clicked the radio on to whatever station, I think it was KFI at the time. And I heard Tom Kelly calling the USC basketball game against Vanderbilt and Clyde Lee and, and SC had John Rudometkin and Chris Appel and said, great player. And I was uh, mesmerized by listening to the thing that I had been at the night before. Mm. And it was Tom Kelly who did such a great job in basketball uh, that hooked me. Uh, the following year, in 62, my dad took me to the SC Duke game. No, he worked at KFPC, the UCLA station. Nobody wanted tickets. You know, they, would, they all got SC tickets, but nobody would take them because they thought they'd, uh, the boss would yell at them or something. So he said, oh, right, three tickets, I'm taking my kid. So I went to see SC play Duke at the start of the season in 62. And uh, I, I got my first glimpse of the Coliseum and, uh, and I saw the horse and the band. And, uh, and then I started listening to Tom Kelly on the radio doing football. And by God, they never lost a game. Uh, they won every game. So my dad, the UCLA fan, had lost me. I was an SC fan now for life. And he got me Rose Bowl tickets. And I got to sit with my grandfather and grandmother, watched SC beat Wisconsin in, in the Rose Bowl. Yeah. Oh, now, fast forward two more years, two more summers to the summer of 65. So, yeah, three, two and a half years. And my dad brought home a record album of the 1964 USC football season, which was narrated by Tom Kelly. Mm. And I remember that 64 season only because that was the second game I ever went to was the Craig Ferdig to Rod Sherman 20 to 17 win over yeah. number one, Notre Dame, last game of the season place going nuts almost have never seen a situation like that since i was 10 i just or just about to turn 10 and i've seen a few sporting events in my day chris and and i've seen some great celebrations but that's top three top yeah. three moment kirk gibson home run miracle on manchester moment yeah. where the place is just coming unglued uh, thank God when he, he came down at halftime, we were down 17, nothing. He was sitting in the press box and I had a single seat under the press box. He says, do you want to go? Cause it looks bad. I said, let's stick around and see what happens. Thank God I stuck around and saw what happened. So that summer I listened to that record album narrated by Frank Baxter and with the play by play highlights of Tom Kelly. And, uh, and, uh, I mean, I wore it out, yeah. uh, I wore out the grooves in the thing, memorizing the passages of Kelly's great calls. I still listen to it when I, you know, feel a little down. I'll throw that on the record player and, and get a little of that. So Kelly was the biggest influence I had, no question. Yeah. A little later, a little later, Chick Hearn was probably the second because the first year he called the Lakers games was actually the playoffs. And I was sitting on a porch with a friend in the neighborhood on Holly Knoll Drive in, in Los Feliz. And uh, we turned on the radio because we were going to listen to, you know, rock and roll music, the kids. And uh, and we, I was flipping around the dial, and boom, there's Chick. And I heard a ba I heard a basketball game, which I recognized from the Tom Kelly stuff. And it was Chick Hearn calling the Lakers from St. Louis against the Hawks and Bob Pettit. So I was, you know, I listened to that forever, and then I became a huge Laker fan. And a little bit later, uh, in '62, the Dodgers were really good, and my mom's a huge Dodger fan, and so I started listening to Vinny. Um, and then my dad got the album of the 1959 Dodgers, the world championship team. So I listened to that thing, uh, all of that mixed all together. Plus we had Dick Enberg calling UCLA games. We had, and then the angels and the Rams, uh, Bob Miller was the Kings later on. We had an awful lot of guys here in town that are just super, uh, yeah. and it's impossible not, not to have been influenced by all of them at some point. 
how do you know when to um, how do you know when to talk and when to let the moment just go? Right. I mean, Vin Scully seemed to be fantastic at that. Right. There were times where where Vinny would just let just let just let it happen. And 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 I don't know how you figure out how to do that. What, what's your take on that? He he explained that his first memories were listening to an old radio and, and actually laying down in his house in, in New York under the radio and listening to the crowd envelop him as they screamed at some event that happened. So he's told, he had told that story for many years. And I remember listening to those albums uh, that, that Kelly put out and he would say, listen to this Coliseum roar. And then it would be 10 seconds of just either static or screaming. You weren't sure. Yeah, yeah. But it really didn't matter because it just filled you. It put you. And having been to that Notre Dame game, I knew what was happening and I knew what it looked like and I knew what it felt like. And so I could kind of feel it when I listened to it. Yeah. Um, my job, it, it, really, when it's boiled down to it, is I call the play, I set the pattern. I tell you who the key guys are, and I call the moment as it's unfolding. Uh, and, and then 90% of the time, I shut up mm. and let my, my color analyst tell us why that happened. Um, but that's not the complete job of a really good play-by-play -play guy, and I consider myself one. Um, I think you have to throw in your personality some and you have to be careful of not overdoing that. Uh, but you want to be personable and you want to be a friend to the listener. You've heard me and I'm talking to you when, when I'm, you know, when I'm broadcasting a game, you're listening and I'm trying to tell you what's going on, but I'm also trying to have fun and be mischievous and tell you a, a story about a guy that I heard last week and weave that into the broadcast too, because it's not all off tackle, right? For two yards, second and eight. Yeah. There's more, there's more to it than that. And I learned that from Scully more than anybody and a little bit from Dick Enberg because his personality quite often came through on the broadcasts. Uh, Chick, Chick did not let that happen very often, and Kelly didn't let that happen very often. Every once in a while, he would throw an aside to his color man or his statistician or something. But, uh, but it was to them, not to you. And, and I think it's important to make that connection. So... Again, easy, but not easy. When do I know that it's time to shut up? The moment calls for it. The moment calls for it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You let them scream a little bit. I've <laughs> There have been a couple of plays. For instance, I, right to coming to mind is the the, the, the Boomister kick against uh, Penn State yep. uh, in the Rose Bowl. And, and I screamed, and J.J., John Jackson, was doing the color at the time, and, and he screamed and started – talking and I and I held my hand up to him like that to tell him to stop and and he he clipped and we let the screaming go on for 15 or 20 seconds he didn't know because he's not a broadcaster as much as he is although he'd done a lot of high school games nothing like yeah. that uh and, and he didn't know necessarily at the moment to to let the crowd do the talking for us and and it was a great moment when once it happened another yeah, half I, a, I got another half a story just a tiny story about that know, it's really funny. Um, I usually do the game sitting down, and, and so does my statistician and my spotter. But the color guy is standing up, and our, and our engineer and our producer are sitting down. So almost everybody's sitting down in the front row. And uh, he made the kick, and we all jumped out of our seats and tipped our chairs over backwards. So you can all, on the broadcast, on the, on the replay, you can hear everything going, da -dum -bum -bum. you can hear this big clanging in the background. And they were screaming and then the cheering. And I screamed, how do you do? And as I was, I wasn't broadcasting to you anymore. I was broadcasting to the 106,000 fans in the Rose Bowl Stadium. So I leaned my head out the window of the press box and I screamed, how do you do to them? And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and as I did, I kind of, the, 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 the table space at the Rose Bowl, ours is big like this. The table space at the Rose Bowl is like this. There's nothing to it. So I leaned over. And I'm leaning out the window to my belt buckle, pretty much. Yeah. Like, one more step and I'm gone. I'll be down in the seats. And JJ reached, reached uh, over and grabbed the back of my pants and pulled me back into the, into the press box. 
That would have been quite a news story had you uh, had you tumbled oh, out of feet. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. What a way so, to go, though. What a way to go. It was. Yeah, look, there are. That was a great moment. I can think of some others. Um, the uh, obviously the the fourth and nine play uh, in South Bend. I, I don't know that, and I was I was there for that. I don't know that I've ever been in a stadium that had that atmosphere before that before that snap. I mean, that place. I've been in Notre Dame many times, and it can sometimes get loud, but I don't know that I've ever felt that. And and immediately when Jared catches that pass, gets tackled about the thirteen yard line, um, it goes from. 120 decibels to about 10. And I was, and I I'd actually, I, I've listened to that and I now can't remember what your, what your play by play was on, on the, at the time. But I remember thinking myself at the time, I didn't have any, I didn't have any words for it. It was, it was such a big moment that, that, uh, that I just, I just, I, I didn't even talk to the people around me. I just sat there and took it in for probably 30 seconds. It was just extraordinary. Just describe what you see. Uh, that's the easiest lesson in, in play-by-play broadcasting. Just yeah. tell us what you're looking at, because there's a ton of people at home that are driving around their car that are blind, whatever it is. They can't see what's going on. So right. we had just talked about the third and 19, and yeah. and Paul Paul McDonald was the color man at the time, and he said, well, you, you don't want to get it all. You yeah, want to get, get, to, get half get, of it, get, which is exactly get what Get some of it. Yeah. Pat Hayden, Pat Hayden on the NBC Notre Dame broadcast tells Tom Hammond the exact same thing. Yeah. And on the field, Steve Sarkeesian is talking to Lane Kiffin on the headset, and they're saying the exact same thing. All of them. So all a bunch of quarterbacks all have the right idea. They all knew exactly what to do. Yeah. Uh, so they got it. And I'm thinking to myself on the third and 19, uh, we're gonna lose for the first time in, in ever. And what am I gonna say? What am I yeah. how am I gonna handle this? What am I gonna say? Uh, but then the play starts, and you don't, you don't, you can't, you don't have time to think about. It. And then it's uh, uh, Bush in the backfield. Leinert's got it. Jared off to the left. This guy off to the right. Leinert changes at the line. He remember he did that little yep. 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 shake. Leinert changes at the line. And before I could think, he had taken the snap. He throws the throws to Jared. He's got it at the. And then I start screaming. So if there was a ten decibel, you could. Probably hear me on the other side of the field because yeah, I was going out pretty good. That's probably right. It was a, it was an amazing moment. I, I think, uh, I for me in my, in my time as a sports fan, I think Kurt Gibson's home run and and fourth and nine are probably the two, uh, probably the two moments that I'll remember most. Just uh, in single moment, yeah, a yeah, single moment, yeah, yeah, exactly. The other the other one for me is is, is Daryl Evans hitting the the. Uh, the the shot in overtime against Edmonton to win Miracle on Manchester. Yeah. That whole thing was ridiculous. There's no way we should even we're down five one and there's no way we should even be in the game. And against that Edmonton team, are you kidding? Yeah. Yeah. Just not not a thing. Uh so, the, the 55 55 24 is pretty good, but it's not a moment. It's like a 35 minute moment. Right. Right. A whole series of it's an avalanche of moments is what that was. <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let me ask you this, because you're in, a, you're in sort of a strange position because you're the play-by-play guy, which means that it's your job to tell, to tell people what's going on. You're also, you're also employed by USC. Mm-hmm. And so you have a situation, not now, thankfully, but it, you know, a few years ago, where USC fans are either apathetic or furious, and there's almost nobody in between. And it's clear that when you watch what happens just about every Saturday, it's a disaster, and it's not what USC football has been or should be. How do you deal with that? Because you're undoubtedly thinking of things that you're not really able to say. Is Brother, that you, and how hard is it? You've come to the right guy. Uh, one one of the very first big jobs I had was calling the L.A. Clippers games when they first moved to L.A. from 84 to 89. Bad basketball. Yeah. yeah. We, we went 12 and 71 here. Uh, really bad. Uh, then uh, I had a couple of good SC years right away, but but the later few years uh, in like in the mid 90s, not so good. Yep. Uh, 
pretty ordinary. Um, and um, I've had, so I went, I did the Bengals for a couple of years and, you know, they weren't any treat on the field. So uh, a wise man, I believe it was Enberg, uh, who uh, back early in my career, I had uh, asked for advice way before I probably should have gotten it from a guy like that. I sent tapes to uh, Scully and Enberg and Chick Hearn, all three, and Tom Kelly, and I received two handwritten, long legal pad notes from Dick Enberg. Nobody else wrote me back, but I got them from Enberg. And one of the things he said was, when all else fails, when your team is horrible, when the game is horrible, call the game. Just call the play. So I I went an extra step with the Clippers. Now you talk about the guys on the team. You talk about the opposition talent. You know, here's Larry Here's Larry Bird. You tell a little story about Larry Bird. Whatever. You, you know they're going to go 12 and 70, but it's still NBA basketball. It's still kind of fun to go see a game. Uh, and to call a game, it was, it was great. It was thrilling. Yeah. So just call the game and have fun and pretend like it's the biggest sporting event you've ever done. Just go for it. And when it's 123 to 90 in the fourth quarter, uh, then you, you look for the future. Well, they're going to have great draft picks next year. We're going to be back next in a week, and we're going to play these three games against these three great teams in the NBA. Let's let's see how this young team can improve. Yeah. Anything yeah. you could do, anything you could do to help the kids, the coaches, the staff, the, they're paying you. So you got to keep it. You got to keep it positive. So you fast forward to the last few years of the Clay Helton era, and I am a Clay Helton fan as a human being. Uh, I, I love the guy. I really do. I think he's a, a really wonderful human being. Yeah. Uh, and I will tell anybody that at all times. Uh, it didn't work out at SC. I always support our coach who's on the field. I support our athletic director who's in the chair, and I support our school president until they change them, and then I support the next one. Yeah, uh, I'm just a loyalist that way. Um, yeah, I knew it wasn't going to work out. Frankly, he and I talked about it not working out, and he knew it wasn't going to work out too. Uh, it was just a matter of time. And yeah. but he he did what he could while he could, and now he's doing it in Georgia Southern, and we'll see him in a couple of years. You know, I'm curious about that. Did uh, when you talked to Clay about it not working out, did did you get a sense from him of why he believed it wasn't going to work out? Well, you know, he ate and breathed the thing, and and I remember him being. We would talk about things other than football. Clearly, yeah. Uh, we, and there was a loss early in the Rose Bowl season. As a matter of fact. Uh, we were on the road, and, and it was a loss that we didn't expect, and we came back, and the plane is unloading, and uh, he's leaning up against some baggage cart with his head down, like, you know, just muttering to himself. And I walked over, I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, uh, you know, it's better days ahead. It's just This is just this week. Let's see what happens. And he turned to me. He says, you know, you're absolutely right. You never know what might happen. And, and then we go on and, you know, win the Rose Bowl. So he, he, I don't. I don't know that he wasn't doing his best. I really don't. I think he was doing his best. I'm sure he. I'm sure he was. I can't imagine having that job and not doing your best. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, all right. I, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned how do you do a second ago? All right. So this is obviously this is obviously your your catchphrase for lack of better uh, uh, better term and. Um, is this something that you bit, that you were saying before? Is it a play-by-play man creation? Or when you're in the grocery store and you see that there's a great sell on chicken breasts, do you give them a, you know, how do you do? I mean, what is it? It came from Scully. It was his. Uh, the Dodgers would be down eight to one in the ninth and rally. Somebody would hit a double and they'd score three. And now they'd be down eight to seven and they'd have the guy at second base, the tying runs at second. And he would... He would call it that way. Here comes Jones. Here comes Smith. Here comes Say. And it's OT, it's eight to seven now. How do you do? Yeah. He always saved it for the most unusual moment because he was not a guy that used a crutch phrase. You might hear how do you do from him four times a year. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. 
but I remembered them because yeah. they were that kind of phrase and that kind of moment. So I was doing the public address announcing at Dodger Stadium uh, concurrently with with uh, starting my job at USC uh, in 1989. Got both jobs at the same time. Uh, that was quite the year. Uh, and early in 90, uh, Vinny on a Sunday came over and asked me, we talked some, not often, but some. And he said, do you want to go to breakfast? You know, because they always serve breakfast to the Dodger uh, press box. Great. So it was several hours before game time. And so we sat down and and he said, how is it compared to how you thought it was going to be hmm. doing, doing the SC games? He said, I said, it's fine, except I don't feel comfortable yet. I don't feel like myself yet. I feel like I'm still channeling Scully and Hearn and Enberg and Kelly and all these guys that I listen to. And he, and he, he put his hand up gently and he said, I know exactly how you feel because when I started with the Dodgers, I was trying to do a little Red Barber and a little De Connie Desmond, a little of these guys that I listened to. He said, you can pay homage to us all you want, but you have to be you because you're the best you there is. Yeah. They, did, they didn't hire me or Bob Miller or Chick Hearn. They hired you to do this job because you have this great knowledge of history going back to when you were a kid covering USC football, when you were a little kid, he said, you got to just be you. And it really helped. Mm. It really. Helped. And, and at the same breakfast, I said, listen, there's a, there's a phrase you use. And I told him what it was. And I said, I'd like to use it on the air, uh, but I don't want to you know, step on your toes. Certainly he goes, it's all yours. I'll never use it again. It's all <laughs> like that. And, and and I only heard him use it one time ever after that. And and I thought that he started to use it one time and he clutched himself back. I could hear him clip his blank, clip his talk. And, and I felt sad that he didn't use it. Um, but I always am so appreciative that he lent it to me all these years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was he was extraordinary. And, and uh, I loved him. I love Chick. Tom Kelly, too. Um, but the other guys I heard a lot more just because they played so many more games. Right, and, right. Um, and, you know, just I don't think I realized when I was a kid just how good those guys were. Um, all right. So we talked about some of your favorite moments. Um, what about your favorite people to cover over the years? Hmm. You know, the guys that I I enjoy the most are the guys when I used to be able to go to practice and, and actually hang out with the players. Yeah. are the guys that would seek me out and talk to me. Now, more often than not, they were special teams weirdos uh, because I sat on the cart across the way next to the trainer's table uh, and they gave me free run of practice, especially during Pete's years. Yeah. Um, but there were other guys, Dallas Sartz and Zach Banner. There were guys, uh, uh, Stanley Havili. Yeah. They were the guys that would come and seek you out and they want to know about your job and your life and how you're doing. And they, they actually became friends over the course of their Kevin Graff and the whole Graff family. Yeah. Uh, those kind of guys, they, they, they look for you. They talk to you. They don't duck. They don't avert their eyes when they see me or a member of the press, they come up to you and they talk to their regular guys. Maybe they will be successful adults. I'd like to think so. Yeah. Uh, those are the guys I like to call the plays for more than any. Uh, 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 oh gosh. I'm forgetting Dickerson's name now. Uh, um, uh, not Sam, the more, Eric Dickerson. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, if you wide receiver, right? Number eighteen. Uh no. Uh, it's killing me. Wait, a Corey well, Dickerson for a while. Well, Corey Dickerson. Corey Dickerson. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Corey Dickerson. Yeah. Corey Dickerson was another one. Really good friend. Yeah. And I, I loved watching him play because I liked talking to him. The quarterbacks were good, good friends. I like talking to Leinart and Barkley and Sanchez, in particular those three guys. Uh, we we would just have chats about nothing, about little league, about yeah. you know movies that we saw, anything, uh, because it was just fun to hang out and talk to them. Now Leinart was a dude that had a very unusual college experience, right? I mean, because because that that 2005 team, by the time USC had had gotten to that point, they'd won so many games in a row two national titles in a row. You, you show up to salute to Troy and, and Matt Leiner is surrounded by security guys. And it was almost like he was like, he was the governor of the state. Um, 
just a really it must have been a pretty it must have been a difficult time for him i assume because the pressure had to have been immense every time usc showed up in an opposing stadium was like the beatles coming to town right it was it was a huge event and um you ever get a sense from him that that maybe that maybe he wasn't enjoying it as much as as he thought he would i've never talked to him i have no idea no, i just always no i don't i don't think so no, i i think he kind of liked that adoration he needed to keep people away from him because he'd just be jostled all the time. And so yeah. he had to keep a security force near him. Um, he's a pretty regular dude. Uh, I ran into him a couple of years ago at the Orange County Fair. Uh, we were going for a concert and he was he had his family there. was coming out and we kind of looked at each other for a second because we hadn't seen each other for a while. Kind of, you know, you give your that cockeyed look. Yeah. And then he, 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 he was like, hey. And he gave me a big hug. And we, we stood there talking for a couple of minutes. And you know, it was like time never passed. Yeah. Uh, old old friends meet at a weird place. That's all it was. Yeah. Um, his personality shows up on on the Fox broadcasts. I think, and I think that's ex he's he's kind of that guy. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I, I like talking to those guys. Those are the guys I like to cover. You know, from a football standpoint, uh, ninety percent of the guys I really love to cover are offensive guys because I'm the offensive play caller, basically. Yeah. Um, I really appreciated the Junior Seaus and the Troy Polamalu's and what they did, but they're for me as a play-by-play -play guy, they're secondary to the play that I'm calling. Right. When they get an interception or or a, or a, a, a sack or a tackle, or Ray Maoluga knocks the guy out of bounds. That's happening as, but my guy's running this way and I'm calling him running. That oh, Maoluga just killed that guy. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Secondary. I never thought. So about I like that, the I like the offensive sense. guys, the Reggie Bush, the Dory Jackson, the uh, the Relief Brown these days. That kind of guy where you could sit up in your chair and say, "What's going to happen next? I better pay attention." Yeah, the the Zach Branches of the world, I think. Well, we'll have, yeah, we'll well, that's out. coming. Yeah, that's coming. I, I I've been telling people that Zach Branch is the is the most skilled open field guy USC's had since Reggie. We'll see whether I'm right, but I think I am. He's extraordinary look forward to that yeah, yeah. there's always guys that, and and you know the guys that we're calling games for in, in, in 10 years are in fourth grade right now so we'll just and i don't yeah. get to scout them as much as i'd like yeah yeah um favorite places to go for usc football games favorite venues right when the the, the games you whether they're a great team that year or not, the places where you look at the counter and say, I'm looking forward to going there. I love that place. I hate going to Austin because their fans are so hostile. Holy mackerel. But boy, what a great atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, I hate myself for saying that I like going to Notre Dame. Um, it's the, the whole atmosphere of the day from going out and walking around the campus and eating a brat or a met and watching the glee club and seeing the band come in and, and to go into the grotto and that whole thing. Uh, and then watching the, and then getting into the stadium, watching their band come in with the Irish guard and all that. They really do it right. I hate them though. Um, Ohio state was pretty cool. It's like, that's, that's, that's like, no, that's like the County fair. There, there's so many. They have booths and games and food and, and Chris. One of the weirdest stories I ever. I didn't know what was going on, and I was walking around campus. I get kicked out of my broadcast booth before the game because they do our pre free game show in there for the two hours before I go on. So I'm either going to sit in this regular press box watching a college game and eating bad food, or I'm going to go out and walk around. So I went. I hadn't been to Ohio State, and I walked around. I had been there once and walked around and I went to uh, St. John's arena, their old basketball arena. And uh, people were going in. I said, Oh, cool. I'll go in and take a look. I've never seen the arena. It's an old piece of, you know, so, uh, and people are sitting in the seats. They're just sitting there. Like the place is like half full and people are just sitting in the seats. I'm thinking maybe this is a, a superstition or I don't know what's going on. So I, I hung around for a few minutes and it just keeps getting fuller and fuller and full. And it's, packed 15 minutes later there's not a seat to be had people are standing in the aisles sitting in the aisles then these big doors open at the end of the stadium the light comes shining through and the ohio state band comes marching in onto the stage 
and they do a full show and the people are clapping and they're singing and doing the whole thing. Then the band parts and the team comes walking in with suits and ties on led by sweater boy, sweater vest boy, Jim Tressel that day. Yeah. And, and he speaks and the captains speak and the band then plays the alma mater. Everybody sings at the top of their lungs. Like it's the national anthem. And then the team and the band turn around and they walk out the back door to the stadium and everybody gets up out of their seats and walks out of St. John's Arena to the stadium following behind them. Huh. That's a great tradition. I love seeing that, and I can't wait to see it again when we go back there next year. That was, the, the, the Horseshoe was a great place to watch a football game. I remember there. And, and I think, look, part of it, let's be honest, part of it was that it was USC who was there, right? I mean, yeah. I remember, because Herb, Herb Street made a comment in, in the booth that night that, He's never seen an Ohio Stadium like that, but it was extraordinary. But I'm with you, and and I know that I know that USC fans are going to be unhappy with me for saying it. Notre Dame is a special place to watch a yep. football game. And, You've got to go I, see a game there. Yeah, I, I think I've I've missed I've missed twice since '97, I think, and I hate to miss because nobody does tradition like Notre Dame does, and and if you if you grew up going to the games in the Coliseum like I did then Notre Dame week was always difficult because the fans, the, the Notre Dame fans at the Coliseum are awful. They're awful. They're drunk. They're belligerent. They're mean. And Notre Dame was beating us every year when I was growing up. It was terrible. <laughs> I was stunned the first time I went to Notre Dame and these people were, you know, well-spoken and polite and intelligent. I thought, I, where have these people been all these years? I'm going to stop you right there. I'm stopping you right there. <laughs> That is a bunch of pucky. <laughs> when you hear, when you go to South Bend and that little old lady security guard who's talking to you and says, welcome to Notre Dame. She's not saying welcome to Notre Dame. You know darn well what she's saying. And Sean Cody, Sean Cody, bless his heart, who's my color man now. Sean Cody, when he hears that, it, he, is, he turns bright red and he says, Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Like the just exact gives it right back to her every single time. I, I look, I hear you. I understand. I'm just saying that you don't get the sort of abuse in South Bend that you get in no. some places. Um, and no, um, it, let me tell you, at 55 24 at halftime, there was, there was a drunk, he, I, he just is what he is. He was a drunk priest <laughs> sitting behind me. Yeah. Me and my girlfriend, and he had a rolled up pro game cr program. And he had been beating us on the back of the seat and the back of our shoulders. How about them Irish? <laughs> like that. He tried to leave partway through the third quarter. And the fans that were taking his garbage blocked the aisle and wouldn't let him out. <laughs> they kept him there for a good 10 minutes and gave it right back to him. Yeah. Well, great, mo great moments in USC football history right there. I, uh, look, I, I, look, there's nothing better than beating the Irish. There is nothing better. It, it, you know, beating Oregon is important. Beating UCLA is very important. Winning the Rose Bowl, important. But beating Notre Dame, beating Notre Dame is different, especially at their place. There is nothing better than beating the Irish at their place. It's been far too long. And I remember Kelly talking about, you know, I think they went 39 years, was it, before they beat them in 67. And uh, he came back and he was still drunk, I think, when he got back to KNX that day. I uh, it, right now, we're in the middle of a little bit of a streak back there, and I don't want it to get any more prolific than it is now. We got to get these guys. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I was I was very spoiled because my first game was '97, and and you know I missed I missed the uh, I missed that game where with Hackett where it was what 24, 24 to three, and then we lose or whatever it was. Oh um, yeah. So I, I had a nice little run where we were winning every uh, every year. That's that's tapered off, although. This will bring us to our last little uh, little topic. Let's talk about let's talk about what USC fans have to look forward to right now. I want to start with a I want to start with a question. I don't know if, if anyone's asked you this before, but you you, you obviously have spoken to Lincoln Riley. Uh, you you spoke to Pete Carroll a lot, and I'm curious, how would you compare the two, just in terms of how they interact with people, how they lead the program? What's your what's your take? I'm not asking you to tell me that that Lincoln Riley is going to win you know, 30 something straight games. I'm just saying, what do you think? Are these guys, are these guys wildly different? Are they similar? They are similar. They're similar in their, 
in the language that they use and the positivity that they bring. I don't know enough about what Lincoln does on the field during practices and during motivational talks, if any, and in the locker room, that kind of thing. I knew more about Pete because Pete was more open and forthcoming about that. Yeah. Uh, and and we actually spent time together. I body surfed with him some with, uh, down in Hermosa with uh, him and Sark in the summer. Yeah. You know, we'd, we'd go share a beverage. Good guy. Uh, sometimes. Uh, Pete was Savanti and that you'd be interviewing him and he would be he'd make he'd do the answer, the rote answer. Uh, but he'd be looking out into space and thinking about something, uh, some play that he had just devised up in his mind, maybe or some defensive scheme. Yeah. Uh, but most of the time he was a ge- the genuine article. I love that he had open practices and let everybody come and see. And uh, the results uh, speak for themselves. And I have written in my book, which is done and waiting for a literary agent and publisher. So if you know anybody, now is the oh, time. Nice. Let's get on board. Um, I wrote about the fact that USC could have won had you changed 12 plays and moved 59 points around in those 12 plays. The Trojans during that long winning streak would have won 109 straight games. 12 plays, 59 points. That's all you'd have to change. Not yeah. very much. Um, so I really love the guy. Um, and, and I don't have the, obviously I don't have the contact with Lincoln that I had with Pete Yeah. every time I do talk to Lincoln, uh, which includes the, the couple of questions I get to ask on the post game show interview. Uh, he answers them right and well, and he doesn't dodge anything. Uh, and he's, and he's very open. Uh, I, I, you know, wish I had a little better relationship with him, but, uh, you get what you get sometimes. And I don't, I don't mind, um, that, that, that's his way of running a football team and a football program. And uh, I never get in the way of the coach. I'm far down the totem pole. I, I don't want to, I don't want to bother anybody. Yeah. Well, I'll say this. Um, I, I don't know Lincoln at all. I've certainly followed his career from afar when he was at OU. Uh, my, my grandfather's from Oklahoma and I have family from Oklahoma. So I've always sort of followed the Sooners. I hate them, but I followed them. Um, <laughs> you know, he, it was, it was an extraordinary hire, and I think for most USC fans, I, probably for every Oklahoma fan and for almost every USC fan, it was shocking that they landed a guy of that caliber. And, um, and you know, it's funny because we had talked earlier about how USC fans were apathetic or furious and, and things just were bad. And, uh, you know, almost immediately the attitude of the fans turns around. What I didn't know is how quickly he would turn it around on the field. Um, and, it, you know, despite the setbacks at the end of the season, what an unbelievable turnaround last year was from just four and eight disaster to 11 wins and being on the brink of the playoff. It must have been fun for you. Yeah, based on what we had just come through in particular. Yeah. Uh, a lot of fun. There were a good many games that were very tense and very exciting. Uh, that could have gone either way. That SC won. Yep. Uh, there, there was one that uh, got away from them, and they lost it. Uh, the record that they had might have well been not as good uh, if they were a little unluckier. They had a great offense. All they had to do was play a little bit better defense, and they just couldn't. Yep. And I expect that they will this year. Yep. So we have something to look forward to because it's that was year one. Chris, if, if I told you as an Oklahoma fan, you told your grandpa, okay? I, 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 if I said your team is going to have a brand-new coaching staff, 50% of the players are going to be brand-new to your program. Granted, they're not all incoming freshmen. There's, there's some guys with some chops. And a tough schedule to boot. How do you think your team's going to do? Well, probably not great. We're not going to win the national championship. Well, SC was on the doorstep of going to the Final Four. And if it weren't for the injury to Caleb, I, I have a feeling they would have won that game. Great. Um, so now we're going into year two. Now your coaching staff is back, and you have those players plus a bunch of new guys that are arguably even better than the guys that they're replacing. Uh, and while the schedule is still very tough, it's backloaded and winnable in most cases. Uh, this this could be and should be injuries is the the great equalizer, but could be and should be even better than last year. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Look, the, the truth is usually it's the second year where a program really makes a jump, right? It's the second year where, where, uh, where people buy in, they understand the program. And, and so I think you would expect an, even without the increased talent in, in the front seven, uh, even without that, uh, I, I think you'd expect a jump. But in light of the the guys they brought in, this is going to be a really good USC team, right? I, I mean, it's going to be a really good USC team. And my only concern, other than injuries, as you pointed out, is I don't know that I've ever seen a, a stretch like the last six games, right? I mean, five of those six are just brutal. And, and it's tough to play well every week. And they're going to have to play well every week the second half of the season. So we'll see. Yeah, they're probably going to – somebody's probably going to jump up and bite them. And to call an undefeated season is foolhardy. I, I, so one of those six, somebody's probably going to jump up and bite them. But if you only lose one, uh, then you're probably going to make the conference championship game. You lose two, probably not. Uh, so, so just get beat one time and you're going to be okay. But you're right. And, and look, as I said, they got to play defense about 25% better, yep. tackle better and play defense about 25% better than they did last year year and they should be just fine and, yeah. and don't get hurt yeah how long and then how long do you leave Caleb in against Nevada well he's you know you're looking for numbers for for personal if you're trying defense. to win the Heisman it's not going to happen Pete get him off the field all right I, I'm with okay all right but you know what the school says yeah I, I don't care what they say if if Caleb Williams gets injured in a game where USC is up 28 because they're trying to get a second Heisman Trophy winner, I will run down to the field and I will beat Lincoln Riley until they pull me off of him. I don't think that I don't think that's going to happen. I think Lincoln Riley knows that 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 winning a national title uh, is far more important than anything else he could accomplish. And, uh, and you get you get four games of Malachi Nelson, and you get a whole season of Miller Moss if you need him, who's really really good. He's he's the Matt Castle. Of, of 2023. Yeah. This and, and guy look, can really play. And don't forget, USC needs to – they need to get backups in the game and build depth and experience because next year's schedule – I mean, you're open with LSU. You've got Michigan, Penn State, and Notre Dame on the schedule. Those guys are going to have to be ready to play. So if you have an opportunity to get real plays for those guys, you got to do it. Man, you talked about going places, Penn State with the whiteout. I want to go to Iowa and see the waving at the hospital. I, yeah. I, I, I haven't been to Wisconsin. Uh, I got to go to the big house. Um, yeah. There's, there, having gone to Nebraska and Arkansas and some of these great places, uh, they've all treated us so well, but there are certain places that I have not been, which kind of resurrected my spirit a little bit, knowing that I'm going to go see teams that I've never seen against USC, no matter where I see them. And stadiums I've never been to. I'm collecting stadiums at this stage in my career, and I, I, I want to see as many as I can get to. I, I don't care. I'm going to Maryland. Good. I'm going. We're going we're gonna to see some great ones over the next five, six years, I think, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it myself. All right. We're just about out of time, so I'm going to ask you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close it with this. Tell me about your favorite game you ever broadcast. It was the uh, third to last one from right now. It wasn't Tulane, and it wasn't Notre Dame. It was the UCLA game mm. this past year from a from a broadcasting standpoint. Um, now, the Oklahoma win, uh, virtually any Notre Dame win, especially the Bush Push game, uh, the Johnny Morton from Marinovich pass in '89. There are a lot of great games. I can go on and on, but for some reason, and I, I'm a perfectionist, Chris. I, uh, I I want to do a whole game where I don't say, um, you know, I have every thought ready to go. All the words that are supposed to be there are there, and I spit them out at the right time. I'm yeah. quiet when I should be, all that. Everything works. Everything clicks. And, and usually that blows up about 35 seconds into the pregame show. And by, and that's a, I, that's a monologue that I write. Right. <laughs> I just, that I blow it as I go along. Um, for whatever reason, in the UCLA game, over there last year, I got through the pregame show clean and I got through the first game segment clean. And then we go to break and that's usually where it falls apart almost every time. But I was on fire. I was going and, and I didn't lose focus. And I just kind of sat there at my desk, just hunched over like, like a player. Like I can't wait to get back on the field. Yeah. And we came back on and I just kept going. I was firing on all cylinders the whole time. 
and we got to the uh, halftime and I hated halftime because I was still playing at full mode and everything was working. And so I didn't, I didn't even go out to get food. I just paced around in, in the box. I just was walking back and forth like a caged animal sort of thing. Yeah. And then the half started and I did the same thing in the second half. And I called that play uh, where DTR throws the interception to Foreman yeah. right on top of it. And the post game show was great. And uh, I was still cooking when I got to the car and on the drive home and I got home to my house in Venice and I went upstairs and I sat with my wife who's sitting behind me listening to the story for the 800th time. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I, I looked at her and I started tearing up and crying. And I said, I finally did it. I, oh. I, I did a complete game where everything was working and it was just magnificent. And, and we beat UCLA and tore their heart out at the end. And it, it just doesn't get any better. Now I, I'm going to try to every game I go in, I try to do that again. Yeah. But boy, that was something I really enjoyed it. Well, if you're going to throw your no hitter, that's a good game to throw it on, right? I mean, that was just a remarkable game. And you mentioned Corey Foreman. Corey Foreman's had a tough go of it at USC, right? The expectations were huge. He hasn't been able to do what I know he wanted to do and what USC fans thought he would do. Corey Foreman's always going to have that moment. And, yeah. and that's going to be remembered for a very long time. That is uh, Jawan's a starling at Notre Dame, uh, picking that's up right. the fumble at the 20 and running. Jawan's a starling is a nobody, but the starling streak will live forever. And Corey Foreman's interception makes him legendary forever. Yeah. Mark Cusano, Notre Dame, twice. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yep. there, there are certain games where you, you may not, I mean, these, you know, these guys, especially Cusano, Cusano was a good, was a good player for a few years, but, but that's what he'll always be known for. And, and you know what, that's right. I mean, knocking down that pass and ending the streak, then turning around the next year and, and, and winning it at Notre Dame. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to have a better, a better line on the resume for a USC football player than that. Yeah. Baker in 31 kicking the uh, field goal against Notre Dame to win in South Bend. And then they had the, the parade for 400,000 people downtown, those kinds of I miss, things. I miss, I miss that one. Pete. Well, me too, but, but <laughs> yeah, you're just, that is who you're a hero forever. And, yeah. and that's, that's something to be said for that. Now, that being said, I want Corey Foreman to play every down this year and, and be the super football player that we thought he was going to be. Yeah. Well, I hope for, I hope that for him and for the team, but uh, if not, 30 years from now, people will see Corey Former on the streets of Los Angeles and say, I remember when you picked off that pass. So I know, I know where I was. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, listen, Pete, this has been fun. I, I appreciate you joining me today. And I know, uh, I know everybody who's going to listen to this uh, appreciates it too. So thank you. I uh, am truly, and I want to say this, uh, not just to you, but to everybody. I really enjoy your writings, the musings. Um, I feel like a, a, a kindred spirit with you. We've never, I don't think we've ever met in person, oh. have we? Well, yeah, no. uh, we're brother from another mother because uh, you, you seem like a guy that talks the same language I do. Well, I appreciate that. And now that I know that you get kicked out of the booth before the game, then uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll say hello to each other before the, uh, before the kickoff. Indeed. Nice job today. Thanks. Thank you. Talk to you soon.